Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, the very handsome, the very lovely, the very special, Loud Lou. Hey, I can be loud now. <laughs> no, not too, not too. But uh, today we have, we're kind of planning to film a couple episodes um, and this first episode, we wanted to film and talk about, that's right, we're filming it, we're on YouTube, you can find us on YouTube, um, but we wanted to talk about um, mixing and specifically the number one advice that we can give everybody and to help them improve their mixes. But before we talk about that, can we talk about your week? How has your week been? It's, uh, it's been fun, you know. Uh... So, I think we did almost seven sessions in four days, um, two of which were Atlantic sessions uh, with this artist. Uh, she goes by Juicy Fruit. Um, apparently, she actually was uh, one of the writers and artists behind uh, the soundtrack for uh, that movie. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Birds of Prey. Oh. Yeah. And That's then kind of cool. uh, we had uh, Dark Knight, uh, uh, who's doing a couple songs with, like uh, Game and Too Short uh, right now. He stuff. came through, and we touched up on some of his music. We had Selena come through. We had Exit. Um, let's see. Who else? Um, oh, you know, we got uh, Wheezy coming in today. He was here this weekend, too. Uh, but, you know, it's been, a, it's been a pretty busy week, but it's all usually in the weekends. But outside of that, just spending time with uh, Anna during the day while we do sessions at night. Yeah, and... Uh I think it's fair to say we made it through December, which is usually the slowest month of the year. We made it. We made oh, it with a yeah. hundred bucks to spare. Uh, it was, we barely made it through the month. Um, no rent out of pocket. And it's been awesome. We've, we've it felt really good. It was our lowest month. It was our slowest month, but it was our most satisfying month. I would say. Oh yeah. Cause it, it, everything came in at the 11th hour. We're eating some lunch pools as we, uh, oh, we're yeah. eating some pizza lunch pools as we do this. We're such adults. But anyway, um, but yeah, so um, again, I, I guess this is our time to, uh, say if you want to, I updated the website today for the oh, studio yeah, yeah. in the mix studios. We got new photos. We got the new B room. There you go. The B room is ready. The A room is ready. We got new pictures. We got a video. We kind of, I kind of just like re-updated the website. We finally hired a, a salesperson. I don't know if sales is the right word, but like studio more like studio booking manager, studio booking manager, marketing and sales kind of help. Shout out uh, to Kevin. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and we got a lot of things in the way. We're going to start, we're ready to, we've already started finishing up the samples. So we're ready to start giving away and selling samples. We might even open up a studio beat stars, uh, and have some beats for artists and everything. We got a lot of stuff in the way. Oh, actually, I actually started the process. I'm creating an only fans. I think that's a little bit different service, but actually, I mean, I'm going to do some tutorials in it. It's oh, just going to be got tasteful. It, got it. So not you know? naked stuff. No, actual no. Like, Patreon type me. stuff. She, Patreon. She said no. <laughs> uh, using... I tried. She she did not go for it. I'm impressed that you tried. I did. I don't have the guts for that stuff. I, we even went outfit shopping. Ooh, like sexy outfits. None of them fit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think this is a great start of the podcast. So let's let's go right into the topic of today, which is what is the number one most helpful tip that we could give to every mix engineer, beginner, advanced, everything in between, to producers? What is the number one most important thing to remember when mixing or producing or even writing a song? Cover your ears. Cover no, that is and not- mute the speakers. Turn off the mic and walk out the room. No, my gosh, that is definitely <laughs> not it. No, I think uh, I think the number one thing is very important, and I keep dragging this on. I, I'm not going to say it quite yet, um, but I, I want to share a story. Actually, this is a combination of a lot of stories. This is a very typical thing that happens. People DM me or email us or whatever. They get in contact with us either via social media or because of the podcast or whatever. And they always ask me, DK, can you give me feedback on a mix? Or, and I listen to the mix and yeah, sure. There's some specific things that I could say, but the number one most important thing that I want everybody to understand. And this is one of those things that you can't really understand unless you just practice and do it. And that is to use your heart and to mix emotionally. Oh yeah. 
And I would say that, I, I think you'd agree with me, balanced mixes are actually straight up boring. And they're very yeah. flat. Like flat balanced mixes are very boring, very, very not fun. It's, it's mixes that are very emotional and things are, things are a little bit not normal or, and they're very confident sounding. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they're very confident sounding. They're, they're very emotional mixes. The kick drums are hard. Like the, the, the drums are hitting hard and the vocals are super loud. And it's not that about the techniques, but I, th- when I imagine a mixer getting all this stuff and making it sound really good, I feel like they were totally inspired. They knew where they wanted to go and they weren't trying to figure out where it can go. They already knew where they wanted to go and they used the techniques that they learned and mixed emotionally to get it where they knew that it can go. You know, what's kind of records always surprised me. You ever, uh, so everybody always talks about, Oh, the mix has to translate, but everybody seems to forget, you know, does it translate emotionally? Like, realistically speaking, it's cool that it translates from speaker to speaker, but if it's a shitty mix, it doesn't matter if it translated. It's a shitty mix. If it doesn't sound like a good record, let's say sometimes, have you ever gotten this? Like, starting out, you know, you would try mixing somebody's record. You're still kind of learning what you're doing, but they'd come back to you and be like, I really like the demo better. Your mix might actually be great, and it may sound good, but realistically speaking i mean i don't get that ever anymore but <laughs> anymore but that's what i'm saying like I'm starting I'm out like a lot of us just go for what we think is quote unquote good like we'll say oh um you know that kick drum we'll shale we'll shove off like 40 hertz that way it can be a little more prominent around 80 and this and that um but it's already too technical in my opinion exactly it's like yo how does it feel like just bring up the fader you know, if if something's off, you're going to obviously clean it up. But what does it sound like together? Like, forget the all the analytical stuff. Like, because you can get somebody who just cut the demo. They felt great that day. The, the rough mix that was going on made them feel very inspired. And so they kept cutting. But then they get to the actual mix and it's like, mm, lackluster. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that this is something that we see all the time. Uh, listening to a bunch of mixes from a lot of people around the world. Um... I would say the number one thing is people get too technical. And I don't think that technical is bad. In fact, I think technical is really good. But once you get to a certain point where you have enough technique behind you, then it sh- the techniques should be automatic. Like you shouldn't have to be thinking, I got to roll off 40 hertz and I got to do this in 80 hertz. Nah, like you got to... You got to really feel the music. After a certain point, like it's not about being technical. It's about just feeling it and letting the technique be autonomous, right? Yeah. And um, I see you do this a lot. You get really technical and do really technical things, but I guarantee that you're not thinking, I got to do this at 40 hertz and then do this at this. Nope. No, nah, you're just feeling it. And yep. you kind of, you have a grab bag, uh, an arsenal of techniques, and you kind of just like, you know what it wants to do and you use the techniques that you have to get it to where you know it can go. Oh, yeah. And I think that, so, so let me, let's put it this way. One of the worst ways that you can mix a song and everybody has to do this in the early stages before they kind of have all those techniques and understanding under their belt is the worst way to mix a song is to try to figure out what the end result is while you're mixing. Yeah. Right. Like when you listen to a song and if you're good enough at mixing, you're going to, in five seconds, you're, you already know in your head what the end result is supposed to sound like, what you kind of want. You may not know exactly what you need to do. You may not realize and say, hey, let's turn up the kick drum. Hey, let's do this. Let's make this brighter. Let's make this darker. It may not come that way, but you kind of have a sense of like, oh, I should do something like this. I kind of really, I really understand what the producer artist is going for. And I, and I know what to do, mm-hmm. right? Or at least I know what to try with the end result already in mind. I think that's super duper important. And, um, and that way you kind of mix emotionally because you're inspired and inspiration is fleeting. I, I always say, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I always say that one of my secrets to why I mix so well, um, I have people that are always like impressed with the speed of my mixing. I do it really, really fast. Um, really, really fast to a point where some people also criticize me for mixing very, very fast. They're like, DK, there's no way that you actually thought through this. There's no way that it's this good because you didn't spend a lot of time on it. I actually think it's the opposite. Um, I'm so fast and so connected to the mix and so connected with my initial inspiration that I felt listening to it the first time Mm -hmm. that 
the faster I do it, the more inspired I stay and the end result is better. Every time I spend eight hours or more on a mix with multiple revisions, it sucks more and more each revision. And um, I honestly think that that's super important, staying inspired. And when you get self-conscious, when you start overthinking, you lose that inspiration. And inspiration is always fleeting. You know, I agree. I've said this before on the podcast, but I've actually had songs where I spent too much time on it. And then people will look at me as I delete that mix and then just start from scratch. I'm like, I don't even want to hear that one. That's not where it should have gone. That's not anywhere near what we should be doing with this mix. Like, I like the rough even more. But. Well, then. My bad, my bad. Damn, I got booted by DK. No, no, it was because there's <laughs> we were both live on Instagram. And my voice was going into both phones, and people were complaining that they couldn't hear what was going on, so I just turned it Oh, got it. Well, yep. hi, guys. I hope you can hear us now. I got, <laughs> I got the boot for y'all. <laughs> but no, but, um, what you were saying. Yeah, so like, I'll actually take a mix and then just completely get rid of it if I don't like it. I've seen you it, do that a lot of times. Yeah, where, but then the end result tends to be like a faster mix. You know, it tends to be like, you know what? I overthought this one. It's, it's just too much. I, I, it sounds good. But it's not what it should be. And that's the big thing. Like, a lot of people think just because it sounds good, it's a good mix. That's not true at all. Like, sometimes I tell people, like, yo, like, I took your mix that you had already, and all I did was clean it up because you had a great mix. It was a great balance. It just needed to be cleaned up. Like, sometimes mixing isn't, like, changing everything that they gave you. Some people I've seen where they take all faders and set it to zero and then they raise them one by one until they get the sound. But then they forget to actually like take a moment and be like, Oh, let me hear what they had. Let me hear what they were going for. That way I know how to express it even more. Amen. Maybe I can find where the emotion was lacking and really emphasize it. Can I, can I say, can I, can I even suggest this may be a little bit blasphemous blasphemy, but can I, can I suggest that, it is not in anyone's best interest to turn all the faders down to zero At when all. you first listen, when you first get the mix. Even if you listen through it once, don't start it from zero. Blasphemy. Like I, I, I really do think like, and dare I say, a lot of these YouTubers and a lot of these less professional mixers, and some more professional mixers will say, please take off all your plugins. And just send me the driest of dry stems. Mm-hmm. And they send it normalized so none of the levels were exactly what they were. Mm-hmm. I think that's the exact opposite of what we want to do. As a mixer, I want the stems with their effects on it. Yes, I don't want the reverb built into the, like, printed with the vocal. I want the reverb as a bus, as an audio track. So that way I can manipulate the reverb alone. And, you know, when I compress the vocals, it doesn't bring out the reverb, et cetera, et cetera. But with the, all this, I would say... Um, you got to you got to respect the rough mix but at the same time you got to listen and hear the potential that they couldn't hear every artist i really commend artists and creators and producers because they are the most headstrong people it takes a lot of confidence and a lot of fighting with yourself to get to a point where you can release content on a regular basis and like even us mm-hmm. like this is kind of hard for us yep. i know that we've been doing it for a couple of years and like this is still kind of hard and like I can't help but kind of be self-conscious sometimes. Oh yeah. I, I one of my biggest fears is actually getting an email back saying, This is terrible. I want my money back. That's my biggest fear. It's never actually I'm not gonna say it's never happened. It's happened once before, and that was shocking enough for me to want to say. I was gonna say if it hasn't better. happened, then you are you really an engineer? No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's happened once before, like that bad, but um, I'm not going to say it happens often enough at all. No, yeah, absolutely, you know I mean? absolutely not. But yeah, it happens that's, that's the biggest fear, right? Like we, we're we scared that people are not going to like our mix, which is natural because the reality is this. Um, I think we've talked about this before. You prefer to mix on your own. You like having people in the room, but you don't like being distracted while mixing. I think I'm actually, work- it's really hard to distract me because I go into flow state. Oh my God, I've, I've seen it. People I've, will ask oh. me questions for minutes and I'll have no idea that they were asking them and they were right next to me. Exactly. I, but, just, I just get really hyper-focused. But for me, it's, uh, I love having the client with me. As you notice, like, uh, the mo- now that we both have our actual studios that we primarily work out of, um, you'll notice that I'll have my clients with me all the time and I actually actively ask them to give me notes on the spot. 
Me too. Like, let me know if I'm going in the wrong direction. Like, I may think something's amazing, but in the end, this is your baby. I want you to be proud of it. I don't want me to be proud of it. I want you to be proud of it. Like, whatever I do, as long as you're proud with the end result that we came up together with, then I'm good. So, so let's talk about that. So because being a creator and being a creative and a, and a producer, uh, not, not a consumer, but a producer of content, not literally like a music mm-hmm. producer, but just in general, a producer, a producer, excuse me. Um, I would say it is our job to show them what their song can become to lift their, their fears and to show them the potential that they like they initially had some some vibes going and the writing like they had an yep. intention they know where it wanted to go your job is to help them take it to where they originally saw but no longer can see because they're too emotionally invested into it now yeah so like as a mixer these artists that are spending so much time trying to not overthink stuff is is now your job is to show them the potential that they originally heard. And, and I think that's the beauty of what we do. And that's why I say that we're like almost like psychologists in the music industry. Because people come in, they realize, okay, we don't know which way is up. We've lost any sort of subjective bias in this. And we need your help, right? Yeah. And then they come out feeling extra competent, feeling extra better about themselves and about their song and about the, the production. And to be honest, what we actually do is kind of minimal. Like, yeah. not like from, I mean, like producing and songwriting changes the song completely. Yep. Mixing doesn't change the song that much relative I to I tell everybody, production. a producer that knows how to engineer is the most dangerous man in the room because he could do the job of the engineer. They don't really need an engineer. At that point, there is no, uh, a lot of times you'll see producers who will mix their own records, you know, but that's because they know the direction that they're trying to go for. In the end, it's their total control. The hard part about finding the the quote unquote right mixer for your production is finding out who's actually invested in your record, who actually knows the sound that you're after, who who actually knows what it takes to go from where you left it to where you need it to go. You know, some uh, have you ever seen this? Like somebody will reach out to you, like, "Hey, I wanted to see if you can mix this record. I had somebody else previously mix it, but it just didn't sound the way I wanted it. It sounded good, but it just didn't sound the way I wanted it." And a lot of times you find that a lot of these guys are are good at like one genre or one particular sound, but they just weren't the right fit for that artist. And I feel like that's what we do. I think we actually, like you said, we build the confidence with the artist, but we form bonds with them to fully understand what it is that they're after so that we can help deliver the final product. But it doesn't come without knowing what they invested into it, what they want out of it. But you really got to know them because like you said, it's emotional. The mix has to actually translate emotionally versus just audibly audibly cool whatever but the artist had a vision we're just making that vision come to light and i think this is really hard to explain because this is one of those things where you you have to be good enough and experienced enough to a certain point and you have to have a lot of techniques in your arsenal and get it to the point where it's kind of automatic you really understand what compression and eq sounds like and what different techniques do to tones of different tracks and sounds Um, but I would say like, it takes some experience, but if you are kind of experienced, if you are trying to get experience, then focus, it's never too early to start focusing on the emotions. Start thinking, how, how do you keep that fleeting inspiration stay in you, right? Instead of chasing after something that's the, uh, the inspiration that's running away, how do you mix it in a way where you keep it with you, right? And if your tools and, and the instrument that we call the DAW, right, and your plugins, da, whatever, da, da. Your, your recording software, if, if, if you're well enough practiced and you know your way around it enough, you no longer are fighting with the software. People ask me, what software should I learn? How should I learn it? I don't even think that's the first step. I think that's something that you need to figure out before the first step. And I don't think it matters what software you use. Just pick one. If you pick it on aesthetics, that's going to be a better reason than any other reason, right? Honestly, just as good of a reason. Mm -hmm. Pick a software, learn it. Don't even, like, that's not even the first step. Learning and understanding your software, your instrument, isn't even the first step. Even with producing, the first step is learning, like, is once you've learned it, using it and implementing it. And... Don't, if you have to wait to be taught, 
then you are not passionate enough to make it professionally. You can be a hobbyist all you want. But if you aren't, like for me, I talk about this. Like when I switched to Pro Tools officially, um, I don't even remember learning Pro Tools because it was just, I had no other choice and I saw no other direction. So I don't remember learning it because it wasn't even my first step. Yeah. My first step in my career was already after I'd learned Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would say um, learn your software, learn your stuff, learn your tools. But here's another really good way that I recommend when I do private lessons for mixing with some of my students, I, I give the same homework, um, especially the first few times, is try mixing a song from scratch in 30 minutes. At 30 minutes, set an alarm on your phone. At 30 minutes, stop and be watching the clock the entire time. Be rushing through the mix and get it to sound as good as possible within 30 minutes. Right? Mm -hmm. And then do it again and take as long as you want. And then do it again in 30 minutes again, three times. So that way you can kind of feel like try to chase that inspiration and, and like really test your skills on if you know your instrument, aka the computer, the software. The second time, really dive deep into it and really try your best and take as much time as you want. Third time, you kind of already know what you want to do because you've done it twice now. So now just do it really fast. And when they do it, most of the time, we find that the third mix is the best mix or the first mix, but it's rarely ever the second mix. Hmm. It's rarely ever the longer one. Um, because I do not agree that time spent on a mix equals quality. And how do you feel about start, drop, come back? Oh, big time, big time, huge. That's yeah. very important. Um, yeah, because that's actually something I'm doing with Exit, and we've been cranking out the mixes and they're coming out great but the biggest thing that we're doing instead of spending an entire day and trying to finish it all in one day because there's a lot of things we're adding production all that kind of stuff so it's almost like still production stage but uh i remember the first day we were mixing one of his new records uh we got uh we got through all the music but then i just leveled out his vocals no eq no compression just got it to sound good bouncing i'm like we'll come back to vocals another day like, because I want fresh ears. I don't want to overthink this. I don't want to be fatigued. I don't want any of this. And that's a big thing. Like, we fatigue ourselves as we take longer time, you know? So we start losing perception of what's actually playing back to us. So even if you had the inspiration two hours later, you probably still don't actually hear what you're doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think this is actually a good segue into talking about our sponsor, FilePass. FilePass is something that I love to use uh, it's filepass.com and the link, the description, the link is in our description as well as on our social media and stuff. Um, FilePass is really awesome. It's kind of like Dropbox where you can upload your mixes, upload your files and people, your clients that you send it to can have a private link where they can have timestamp comments on it. And the best part of it is that it plays back the audio file uncompressed. So mm -hmm. if you upload a WAV file, it doesn't go through any Google Drive or Dropbox compression. It plays back the WAV file. Um, and you can also like make sure people can't download it so you can't pay for it. I had a studio out in Utah that I convinced use it. And he said, ever since he started using Dropbox, there was no money leaking. He never got screwed file over. File pass or Dropbox? F file pass. File okay. pass. His money is no longer leaking. There's no clients that are accidentally or even on purpose screwing him over because it's impossible to do so. And more people are now paying up front because they know that there's going to be an expectation of, of pay whatever. Right. So he's protected himself. It's kind of like insurance. I really, really recommend it. Uh, filepass.com. But the, I, the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because I do this a lot with FilePass is the comments are made for, um, for the clients to leave revision requests. I listen to my own mixes in the car, on the headphones, especially ones where I left the studio not feeling super confident. I'm not going to tell the client that I'm going to give them another revision, but I'm going to leave comments myself before I send them. Like oftentimes I send the clients mix two and not mix one ever. Like they don't even see mix one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I can leave comments on it for myself and then I can go back to, I can listen to it and it plays the full resolution. So I really feel like I can understand what I want to do and then go back and fix it up and do what I want to do before getting it to the artist. Um, so again, like there's a lot of different ways to mix better, but I would say again, the number one most important way of improving your mixes is to use your heart. Like people say, use your ears, but let's take it one more level further and say, use your heart. We all listen to music. 
you don't get into this industry if you're not a fan of music. Like, that's never going to happen. We all listen to music, and we listen to enough music that we know inherently what good music is supposed to sound like. We, you don't even have to be an engineer. You could be a total consumer and barely a consumer and still know that something is off, right? Yeah. Because that person will probably listen to music. But they might not be able to name what's off. Engineers may be able to name what's off, but they don't know how what it is, but it's off. They can recognize it. So use your heart. You know what's right and wrong. You don't have to overthink it. Just practice. Just put in the hours. Use your emotions and mix it to the best you can. Take breaks. Come back oh, to yeah. it another day. Take some criticism. Take some feedback. Learn your tools. All that jazz. Use your heart. Any last words? Any no, I thoughts? think you got it. So on that note, thank you so much for listening. Please leave us a five-star review. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we really appreciate the help. You can follow us on uh, Spotify. Our Spotify listeners have grown incredibly. Actually, our most of our listeners come from Spotify, not Apple nice. Podcasts, which is actually good good on Spotify. Apple was dominating the market for a while, but yeah, and uh, hmm. and we do have free mixed guides PDFs on links.dkmixes.com, which is uh, on the description. Again, links in the description or on our Instagram page. Um, and we hope everybody is safe from Corona and everything. Happy mixing my friends and stay saucy. One, two, three. <laughs>If you'd like to take advantage of my free guides and online videos, please check out links.dkmixes.com. That's links.dekeimixes.com.